all, thanks, Stephanie, for that very nice introduction. And my thanks to Stephanie and to uh, UC Merced for inviting me here. And uh, great to be here. And also very nice to be part of this uh, Mercy initiative, which seems like a really great, great thing. So uh, thank you. So <clears throat> my talk today has two parts. Uh, the first part, I'm going to present some recent work on repetition and information flow in both music and language. And uh, in the second part, I'm going to talk about some very recent work, not yet published, um, looking at the repetition of rare constructions in language from an alternative viewpoint. And uh, again, this is very new work, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts about it. So here we have a sentence and a melody. But what do they have in common? So the sentence, this is from the Brown Corpus, a large corpus of uh, English written text from various sources. A tug of war between an old bottle and an inefficient corkscrew may do as much harm as a week at sea. And the point of this sentence is that you can damage a bottle of wine by shaking it. And here's the melody. So what do these two things have in common? Well, both the sentence and the melody contain a repeated pattern. So in the sentence, it's a repeated syntactic pattern, determiner, adjective, noun. And in the melody, it's a pattern of rhythms and intervals. Intervals meaning uh, pitch distances between adjacent pitches. In both cases also, the second instance of the pattern differs from the first in some respect. In the sentence, obviously, the words are different. In the melody, the final interval is different. So whereas this is a, a rising fourth, this is a rising sixth. If you know a bit about music, you'll know this confusing terminology where an interval that goes up by three steps is actually called a, a fourth. Also in both cases, the second instance of the pattern is lower in probability than the first. So the words inefficient corkscrew are less probable than the words old bottle. You can just take my word for it on that. And also a rising sixth is less probable than a rising fourth. So there's a general principle here that when a pattern is repeated, its specific features tend to be less probable in the second instance than in the first instance. Here we have another sentence and melody. What do these have in common? So here's a sentence from the Wall Street Journal. Its ambiguity and uneasy mixture of the serious and the comic is no doubt one reason why it is in very, very much in vogue with directors just now. And here's a melody by Bach. So again, there's a repeated pattern. In the sentence, we have, again, a repeated pattern, a syntactic pattern, a determiner adjective forming a noun phrase, sort of an unusual pattern, sometimes known as a substantivized adjective. In uh, the melody, we have a pattern of unresolved chord tones. And this gets a little bit technical musically, but it's basically a a non-chord tone is a, note, is a note that's not part of the current chord. And if a chord tone resolves, if a non-chord tone resolves, that means it moves by step to the next note. But these notes leap to the next note, so that makes them unresolved. cases, the pattern itself is low in, in probability. Substantivized adjectives are rare, and unresolved non-chord tones are rare. So here again, there's a general principle across both music and language that patterns that in themselves are low in probability tend to be used in contexts where they are repeated. The two principles, once again, so in this talk, I'm going to present evidence that these two principles hold true 
in both music and language. And I'm going to offer an explanation for them based on the framework of the uniform information density proposed by uh, Roger Levy and Florian Jaeger. So information, as you probably know, is the negative log of probability. This very hard to read graph is supposed to show that, just showing the, the inverse relationship between the two. So events that are low in probability are high in information. So the gist of the UID theory is that processing is facilitated when the rate of information flow maintains a fairly uniform, consistent level. So for example, languages can be achieved by pronouncing low probability words more slowly, or by inserting optional words before low probability phrases. For example, the optional complementizer, that in English, uh, which can be um, used or omitted before a dependent clause or before a relative clause, um, tends to be used more often if the following words are, are low in probability. So we can also draw a further prediction from UID, which is that when a, measure, when a message or part of a message is low probability in one respect, it will tend to be high probability in another respect. So let's think about how that might apply to the phenomenon <coughs> I just discussed. First language, this idea that um, the, second the second instance of a pattern tends to be lower in probability or higher in information. A tug of war between an old bottle and an inefficient corkscrew. So in the coordinate noun phrases, that is phrases of the form X and Y, where X and Y are both noun phrases, there's a strong tendency for the syntactic structure of the second coordinate phrase to match the structure of the first. Uh, this has been shown by Adubi's work with his colleagues and several other studies. And um, this is sometimes known as parallelism. And when this happens, it's somewhat predictable, just because it's, it tends to happen. Um, and that means that uh, the syntactic information of the second coordinate is relatively low. The syntactic structure of the second coordinate is fairly predictable in that case. So the UID theory says that the Y phrase will tend to be high in information in other ways. For example, it should tend to have less probable words and word patterns, which is exactly what we see in this sentence here. So Dan Gilday, my colleague at uh, University of Rochester, and I examined this production, this prediction, in a corpus of uh, written English, um, the Wall Street Journal portion of the Penn Tree Bank corpus. That's about a million words of written text. So we considered only noun phrases of the form noun phrase, conjunction, noun phrase, where uh, the coordinating conjunction such as and, but, or, or. So a noun phrase can expand in a wide variety of different ways. And, um, these are convention, the convention, labeling conventions used in the Penn Tree Bank. Not everyone will necessarily agree with them, but this is the data we're working with. So you can have an expansion like that, where it just expands to three words, or it might expand to phrases. So NP followed by S bar, the man we saw yesterday, so that would be a relative clause construction. Or a noun phrase followed by a prepositional phrase. Or it could be a mixture of words and phrases. So determiner, noun, s bar. And there's a, many other possible expansions as well. <clears throat> so we did distinguish matching coordinates where the two phrases have the same top level expansion from non-matching ones where they don't. So this is an example of a matching coordinate and this is a non-matching. So for each possible type of expansion, that is for each possible top level expansion, we just looked at the matching coordinates and we calculated the lexical probabilities of the first conjuncts with that expansion and did the same for the second conjuncts. So what do I mean by the lexical probability of a phrase? We calculated that as just the average log probability of the words. And to calculate the probability of a word, we looked at its conditional probability given the previous two words, or um, what some might call the trigram probability. And we extracted these probabilities from a much larger 40 million word corpus. So this measure is going to be influenced by the just the raw probabilities of the words. Generally, high frequency words will be higher in probability. But it's also influenced by the context. So a phrase like chairman of the board will have high probability because 
these words often occur in, in, these, in this context. But a phrase like board the of chairman is going to have very low probability because of very rarely occurs after the. So across all expansion types, we found that indeed second conjuncts do have a lower lexical probability than first conjuncts. Pretty small but significant difference. Now, there have been other differences that have been observed between first and conjuncts. Um, Benor and Levy uh, noted that um, second conjuncts tend to feature new rather than given information. And you might wonder, perhaps somehow this could explain the pattern that we observed. So to look at this, we did another test. So this time, for each expansion, we looked at all tokens with that expansion in the second conjunct, but we compared cases where the first conjunct matched it to those where it didn't. So this would be just taking this expansion uh, determiner adjective noun. This would be a case where the first conjunct matches it syntactically. And this would be a case where it doesn't. So since these, this repetition of syntactic structures is highly probable, the syntactic structure of the second conjunct is more predictable in this case than in this case. It's more expected. Lower in information in this case than in this case. So our prediction is that the lexical probabilities of the second conjunct should be lower in sentences like this than in sentences like this. Because the, uh, or, or the information, lexical information should be higher in this case because syntactic information is lower. But it, I, given versus new account doesn't predict any difference between these two cases. And indeed, uh, lexical probabilities are lower in uh, matching conjuncts than in non-matching ones. So, now turning to the music case. Um, here I took a different approach. And uh, if you try to find something in music that's exactly analogous to this, you'll drive yourself crazy, which is what I did for a long time. But then I decided to step back and just think about more abstract parallels between music and language. So this is looking at the same basic principle in a very different way. So one kind of repetition in music that's very common is repetition of interval patterns. We see this all the time, a couple of Mozart melodies. I mean, you see it all over the place. That's a repetition of an interval pattern. The notes change, but the intervals between the notes stay the same. And when I'm talking about intervals here, I'm talking about diatonic intervals, that is, intervals in steps on the staff, or you could also think of them as intervals on the relevant major or minor scale, not chromatic intervals. So, or if you think in terms of actual chromatic intervals, that is frequency ratios, this is a major third and that's a minor third. But in terms of diatonic intervals, they're both thirds. They're both going up by, by two. Um, so rep repetition can, it hap can happen at many temporal distances, but it's especially common at distances of one measure, as in this case, or two measures, as in this case. And that's something that I've shown statistically in this uh, article, but I won't talk about it here. So, when an interval pattern repeats at a distance of one measure, the second instance of the pattern is low in information. That is, it's predictable. We sort of, it's not surprising because it's something that composers do very often. So, the composer might want to liven it up. How would they liven it up? Maybe by changing one of the intervals. Now, generally, interval probability decreases as size increases. This shows um, from a large corpus of classical themes the probability of different intervals, diatonic intervals. You can see, with the exception of zero, that is a repetition. Intervals de decrease in probability as size increases. And steps are by far the most common interval, either a descending step or an ascending step. So if you had a pattern and you really wanted to boost the information content of the second instance of the pattern, 
you probably change one of the intervals to a larger interval, right? Because that's really going to increase the information content. So the prediction is that when composers do this, changing one interval in a pattern, they'll change it to a larger interval rather than to a smaller one. So I looked at this tendency in uh, a corpus of about 10,000 classical themes from a, a dictionary of musical themes by Barlow and Morgenstern. And I identified all cases in which two adjacent measures have the same diatonic interval pattern except for one interval. So for example, this one, both times it goes up a step, down a step, but here it goes up a, a fifth, and here it goes up a seventh. And then I just looked at the average interval size in the first measure of the pattern, and the average interval size in the second. And across all of these uh, tokens, the average interval size in the first measure, 2.43, is less than in the second measure, 2.72. So the prediction is confirmed, and it is highly significant. Now there's another aspect of the probability of a melody that we could look at, which concerns the relationship of the notes to the key. And in particular, notes within the scale of the key are more probable than those outside it. Again, if you know uh, a bit about music, you've studied an instrument, you probably know about chromatic notes, right? Notes that are outside the scale of, of the key. These are indicated by sharp or flat signs as in this note here. Um, <clears throat> so in cases where, again, where you're exactly repeating a diatonic interval pattern from one measure to the next, we would predict that there would be more chromatic notes in the second measure. Again, that's a way of boosting the information content in the second measure, since the second measure is otherwise going to be rather predictable. And this Mozart melody that I just played a minute ago is an example where the prediction is confirmed. So I looked at this in the Barlow and Morgenstern corpus. I looked at cases where the diatonic interval pattern is repeated exactly from one measure to the next. And one measure or the other or both contains at least one chromatic note. And here again, we see the average number of chromatic notes is higher in the second measure than in the first. Um, pretty substantial difference and again, significant. So summing up so far, both music and language, in very different ways, seem to show evidence that second pattern instances are higher in information. In language, the second conjunction in NP coordinate phrases has lower probability word patterns. In music, the second measure in intervallic repetition or near repetition has the larger intervals and more chromatic notes. So let's move on to the second principle. This is the idea that patterns that are in themselves low in probability tend to repeat. And this, too, I think, can be explained in terms of UID. So a low probability pattern of any kind is going to cause a spike in information. It's going to cause the information load to, to suddenly go up. And now if you then repeat the pattern, that causes a dip in information that may somehow compensate for that spike. And um, here you have to think about um, the processing of one phrase or, or one segment sort of spilling over to the processing of, of the next. So that when we hear a high information um, phrase, um, we're still sort of processing it when we hear the next phrase, perhaps, so that you can uh, facilitate that process by lowering the information of the following phrase. So in language, there's a clear prediction with these um, coordinate phrases that we were looking at before. So as we know, there's a strong tendency for the second noun phrase to match the first. And we should predict that this tendency should be especially strong if the expansion is rare, right? If um, you're using a rare syntactic construction in that first NP, there should be a strong tendency to repeat it because that will sort of um, mitigate this spike of information in the first phrase. So Dan and I looked at this again in the same corpus. So first we calculated the context-free probability of each NP expansion. That is simply the proportion of NPs in which it occurs. And then for each expansion, we multiplied this context-free probability 
by the number of occurrences of that expansion in first conjuncts. So that tells us sort of the expected count of the expansion in second conjuncts, right? If there was no preference or no tendency towards repetition, um, this would give us uh, the expected number of occurrences of the expansion in, in the second conjunct. <clears throat> and then we looked at the actual frequency of the expansion in the second conjunct, matching second conjuncts, where the first conjunct has the same expansion. And the ratio of this actual frequency to the expected frequency is what we call the parallel parallelism ratio. That is, it's the strength of the tendency towards repetition. So across all almost 5,000 tokens of this phrase, of this pattern in the, uh, in the data set, there were about 1,000 matching tokens. That compares to an expected count of only 170 tokens. So um, this shows the general tendency towards repetition in um, NP coordinate phrases, right? Repetition occurs much more strongly overall than, than what you would expect by chance. But this also proves to be strongly dependent on the probability of the expansion. So we bend the expansions by their probabilities um, on a log scale. So these are all the expansions whose probability is very low, um, less than 0.0032, and these are the most probable expansions. There was only one in this category, actually. And um, you can see that the parallelism ratio increases sharply as the expansion probability decreases, just as we predicted. So these rare constructions seem to have a much stronger tendency to repeat than the, prop, than the more probable ones. Now, um, there's been a lot of research on the general phenomenon of repetition within sentences, across sentences, between um, speakers in a conversation. And, um, it's, generally known as priming, or it's very much related to this more general phenomenon of priming. And um, research on priming has found that there's an increased tendency for repetition of rare construct for rare <coughs> constructions in general, and not just in coordinate constructions. That is, in general, rare constructions show a stronger tendency to repeat themselves than common ones do. This is called the inverse frequency effect. And you might wonder if our results are simply due to that. So Dan and I repeated the test, but this time we looked at cases where the two NPs are separated by a single word that's not a conjunction, right? So a case like this, the dog in the yard, in this case the two NPs are separated by a preposition. So they're separated by the same distance as they would be in a coordinate phrase, but it's not a coordinate phrase. And we call these nearly adjacent NP pairs. And for nearly adjacent pairs, you can see that the tendency towards parallelism is much less than for coordinate pairs, and also the inverse frequency effect is, is much less pronounced. So there is some tendency, even here, for rare constructions to be um, repeated more, but it's less pronounced than, um, than for coordinate phrases. So that suggests that the tendency to repeat rare expansions in coordinate construction is not just the general effect of short distance primal. So once again, we move on to the case of music. Is there anything analogous to this in music? Well, we've seen that there is a tendency to repeat intervallic patterns, especially at certain distances, like at the distance of one measure. But unlike the language case, it's difficult to identify situations where this is especially likely. We can just say it's always likely. It's always expected. So the prediction might just be patterns that repeat should involve more low probability events and patterns that don't repeat. And there's some informal evidence for this. Um, I've been teaching counterpoint a lot at Eastman lately, and we use a book by uh, Robert Galden, Practical Approach to 18th Century Counterpoint. And he discusses certain kinds of non-chord tones that are especially rare, such as anticipations. That's where the non-chord tone anticipates the note that it's going to resolve to or escape tones where it moves by leap to the note that it's going to resolve to, or a leaping tone where the note is approached by leap and resolved by step. Um, and Golden writes, although each of these can be exploited motivically, 
all three are much less common than passing or neighboring tone. The, the passing or neighboring tone is a note that's both approached and left by step. <clears throat> Exploited motivically means used repetitively or used in, in a motive, right? So what he's saying is that um, these three kinds of non-chord tones are rare, but they can be exploited in cases where they are repeated, which is exactly what, what we would expect. What our hypothesis is, my hypothesis is that rare patterns tend to show a tendency towards repetition. And then later he says, a pagetura is approached by a leap. So an appoggiatura is a non-chord tone that's on the beat. Right? That second note is on the beat. Um, appoggiatura is approached by leap, perhaps the rarest dissonance of the Baroque period, often tend to occur in sequences. Well, a sequence is a repeated pattern. So there again, rare patterns tend to be used repetitively. So that's sort of conventional wisdom. Here's a bit of anecdotal evidence. Um, these are three of Bach's most famous melodies. So that's, that's the one I played earlier. That has the um, escape tones, uh, non-chord tones resolving by lead. Jesus of Joy of Man's Desiring, another famous one. So, those are anticipations. And then this organ fugue, that has, again, escape tones. So in each of these cases, we have a, a rare kind of non-chord tone that's used in a repeated pattern, just as we would expect. <clears throat> so we've got conventional wisdom, we've got anecdotal evidence. Do we have statistical evidence? Well, I tried a number of ways of looking at it, and um, I'm just going to report the way that seemed to me most valid rather than the way that gets the best results. Um, I looked at one measure patterns in that same corpus of classical themes and looked at their <coughs> interval size. And I wanted to compare repeated measures, measures that are repetitions with measures that are not repetitions. And it seemed important to only compare measures that have the same number of notes because a measure with more notes is gonna have more information, right? And notes in themselves create information because for every note, there's a decision about what the pitch is, and that's, that's going to be information. And it also seemed important to compare measures within the same melody. And in identifying non-repetitions, it seemed best to only look at measures whose rhythm differs from the previous measure, because rhythm itself is a kind of information, and there's some expectation for the rhythm to repeat. So if we really want a measure to be a non-repetition, it shouldn't even have the same rhythm as the previous measure. So I looked at each measure, I looked at each melody in the corpus that contained two adjacent measures with the same rhythm and diatonic interval pattern, and a third measure with the same number of notes whose rhythm differs from the previous measure. So this little artificial melody that I made. It's just a very simple example. These two measures have four notes each, same rhythm and diatonic. Interval pattern, this measure also has four notes, but its <clears throat> rhythm differs from the previous measure. And by the way, if its rhythm differs, it doesn't really matter if this interval pattern is the same because when two measures have the same rhythm, they just seem different no matter what, what their interval pattern is. And there were 578 melodies that met, this, met these criteria. <clears throat> and here are the results. So for the matching measures, Mean interval size is 1.389. For non-matching measures, 1.487. So the prediction is not confirmed. The average interval size is actually slightly greater for non-matching measures. So in this case, the prediction is, is not supported. So putting it all together, does repetition in music and language support the prediction of BYD? Higher information in second instances? Yes in language, yes in music. More repetition of low probability patterns. Yes in language, not really in music. <clears throat>
I, there's conventional wisdom supporting it in this uh, textbook, and there's anecdotal evidence for it in those block melodies, but it's not supported by corpus data. Why is this last phenomenon not found? Well, it's hard to know. It's possibly it's outweighed by other musical factors. Maybe these non-repeating measures tend to occur at phrase boundaries or cadence points, and often those have large intervals because it might be the end of one phrase and the beginning of another. So. to start another phrase, and the boundary between one phrase and the next phrase is often a large interval. Or maybe my way of defining repeating versus non-repeating is inadequate. There's a whole spectrum <coughs> of, from exact repetition of even pitches, to repetition of intervals, to altered repetition, to repet repetition of contour, that is repetition of ups and downs without the intervals being the same to just rhythmic repetition to non-repetition. And I divided that up in a particular way, but there are other ways of dividing it up where you get somewhat better results. But as I said, I, I thought the way I just presented was the most principled way of doing it. But there isn't any way of dividing it up where you get really strong results in the predicted, predicted direction. So maybe the prediction is just false. And um, this is always a possibility. And so this is something that I want to study further. Anyway, there's at least some evidence that the use of repetition in language and music follows the prediction of UID. And um, clearly, I'm arguing here for parallels between music and language. And this has been a very active area of research. Uh, probably uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Ani Patel's um, important book on music and language, which um, spurred a lot of other um, research on this topic. And um, some people have made quite specific, uh, some people have attempted to make quite specific mappings between music and language. But in my view, these attempts haven't been very successful. Um, and even the most, at the most basic level, if you think about this basic hierarchy of phonology, morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics, that we assume in language. Mapping that onto music is extremely problematic and people argue about what, what in music is exactly parallel to syntax or what's exactly parallel to phonology. It's a very murky. Um, and it, my view is that there are interesting parallels between music and language, but I think um, perhaps they are to be found at a more abstract level, parallels um, along the lines of the ones I've been drawing here. So that's the first part of my talk. Um, the second part, which will be shorter, is again some very recent work that I've been doing. And it's um, taking another look at this phenomenon of that, that rare patterns tend to be repeated, and it's looking specifically at, <coughs> at language. Let's go back to this uh, sentence. It's an easy mixture of the serious and the comic. So that's a rare expansion of a noun phrase used repetitively. Just to give you a flavor of what this data looks like, <coughs> I made a complete list of all the substantivized adjectives in the one million word Wall Street Journal corpus. Now I excluded certain very, whoops, I excluded certain very common cases the first, the second, the same, the other. And I excluded a few cases that I thought were just mislabeled, like the public, which I don't think is really an, an adjective. And I highlighted sentences that contain more than one, um, more than one token of the pattern. So you can see that there are the um, phrases of interest are, are in red. The elderly, the affluent, the well-to-do, the poor, the elderly. So a lot of them are cliché phrases that we've all heard many times, right? The poor, the elderly, or the rich, the affluent, which is basically the rich. There's one with two tokens. The uninsured, dealing with the uninsured and long-term care for the elderly. The elderly, the poor, the poor, the law-abiding, that's somewhat less common. The former, the latter, 
Collect premiums from the healthy, dump the sick. So that's one that's not so common. This is an interesting one because oh, the red, well that's not common, but it is sort of anticipated here. They claim that the Fed would first give a green light to the economy and then turn on the red, right? So even that is sort of a repetition. The poor, the art of the possible, that sort of a cliche. Now there's the one I talked about before, the serious and, and the common. So that's an, a case I think where you could say this construction is really being used productively, right? That is, it's being used, it's not just a cliched frozen phrase, it's, it's probably a phrase. The serious, the comic, those are phrases that we've probably never heard before or used before. The elderly, the deep, that's a cliche. The wild, that's a cliche. The dead. There's a reason why I'm doing this. Here's another one. They use the telephone to extract money from the gullible and the greedy. There again, I think that's a productive one. I don't think you've I doubt that you've ever heard anyone talk about the gullible before. Fox hunting has been defined as the unspeakable in pursuit of the inedible. Again, a productive one. Called the uninformed trudging after the incomprehensible. A productive one. Disabled. The China penalizes the efficient and rewards the incompetent. A productive one. The elderly, the poor, the poor, the poor, the rich. They cross the line from the immoral to the illegal. The productive one. The quick, that's kind of an idiom. Cuts to the quick. The latter, the ordinary, the homeless, the well-to-do, the super rich. So almost without exception, the productive ones are ones that are used repetitively, right? The productive ones are used in sentences that contain more than one token of the construction. So I think that's a very clear-cut case of, of this, the clear-cut illustration of, of this phenomenon. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. So that's the phenomenon that I want to explain. So um, I argued before that this tendency could be attributed to uniform information density. But you might say that isn't wholly convincing. So I suggested that repetition softens the spike of, of information in the second phrase. But it doesn't help the spike in, in the first phrase, unless we assume some kind of spillover of information from the, of spillover of processing from the first phrase to the second one. And perhaps this is questionable. And there's also some tendency towards repetition in general, not just in coordinate phrases. And a number of those cases that I just showed you were cases where where the phrase repeated, but not in a coordinate phrase, right? It repeated in the sentence, but not necessarily in a coordinate construction. So I've been thinking about an alternative way of explaining this. So let's think about some general principles of sentence processing. I put facts with a question mark because I'm not sure everyone will agree with them, but we'll see. So sentence processing is computationally very difficult. Even the best parsers Day, get maybe 90%, low 90s percent of constituents correct, which means the number of sentences they parse perfectly is much lower than that. And this is largely because of ambiguity. Ordinary sentences can have hundreds or even thousands of grammatical parses. And to some people, um, might question that, but it's true. And ask a computational linguist. Um, and I, I can give you evidence of that if you want. So how do we as humans find the correct interpretation of a sentence? Well, I think most people agree now that the way we do it is by bringing to bear many kinds of knowledge of information. Not just syntactic knowledge, um, which is, by the way, probabilistic. We have knowledge that some constructions are more probable than others. But also semantic knowledge, pragmatic knowledge, contextual knowledge. Um, my colleagues in uh, the cognitive science of Rochester have played a big role in, um, in showing this, that uh, we bring to bear all these kinds of information in parsing. 
ambiguities can't be resolved in a purely local fashion, especially once you start considering pragmatic information, contextual information. You have to consider <coughs> possible interpretations of the whole sentence. Although you probably, we probably don't consider hundreds of, of analyses of a long sentence, but we need to consider at least a sizable chunk of the sentence in order to parse it effectively. And even within that chunk, there could be many different analyses. So I think the big mystery of human sentence processing is how we do this. It's not so much how we choose the best analysis or how, how we evaluate different analyses, but how we do it so quickly. Um, and perhaps part of the answer lies on the production end. Maybe, there are, maybe languages have evolved to somehow limit the explosion of possible analyses um, in ways that um, facilitate comprehension. So here's a case in point that's kind of may seem like a digression, but it's something I've been looking at lately. And it's what's called main clause phenomena. <coughs> and main clause phenomena are syntactic structures that occur only or mostly in main clauses. So for example, NP topicalization. You could say mushroom pizza she can't stand, topicalizing the object, putting it at the front of the clause. But it sounds strange to say, I forgot that mushroom pizza she can't stand. Or, she won't eat with us if mushroom pizza she can't stand. <laughs> Those sentences sound weird. Another example is participle preposing. That is, putting the, inverting the, the subject and the verb and putting the participle phrase at the beginning. Carrying the flag was one of the town's leading citizens. That sounds okay, but I forgot that carrying the flag was one of the town's leading citizens. Or, I'll be happy if carrying the flag is one of the town's leading citizens. Those sentences sound strange. I put question marks because I'm not sure everyone would consider them incorrect, but at best I think you'll, you'll agree that they sound awkward. There's a bunch of other main clause phenomena. These have been widely discussed. There are other kinds of um, sentence verb, uh, subject verb inversion, a locative inversion, a negative inversion, subject position infinitives. To read so many books is a waste of time or subject position clauses that Henry forgot the key irritated Carmen. All these things are things that sound okay in main clauses, but when you put them in subordinate clauses, they sound weird. So my idea is that these are all rare constructions to begin with, and if you allow them to occur even in dependent clause situations, they would greatly increase the number of possible syntactic interpretations of a sense, even when they weren't intended. So um, previous explanations for these have focused on certain syntactic processes, like the fact that in a dependent clause, there's usually a complementizer, which sort of blocks the movement of something else into that position. Or pragmatic explanations, like some people have said that uh, these main clause phenomena have to be in, in clauses that are asserted by the, the speaker, and a dependent clause is often not asserted. Um, but I, I noticed that these constructions seem to occur mainly in sentence initial main clauses. Um, very rarely in non-initial coordinate clauses. Like you very rarely see something like, the band played and carrying the flag was one of the town's leading citizens. Now that's something that syntactically would be considered a main clause by most people, but it's not a sentence initial main clause. Or here, at the parade, carrying the flag was one of the town's leading citizens. Again, that I think sounds awkward. Again, that's a main clause, but it's not sentence initial. And um, I did a corpus analysis to examine this. So I used a million words of hand parsed text and 10 million words of automatically parsed text. And I looked for occurrences of the seven main clause constructions that I listed earlier in four environments. Sentence initial main clauses, non-initial coordinate clauses, pre-modified main clauses, and embedded clauses. And for these three environments, I looked at the expected frequency of each main clause construction, assuming that it was no different from the sentence initial environment. And then I compared, the, um, compared that to the actual frequency of the main clause construction in each of these non-initial environments. And there's the data, and you can see 
that for all 21 cases, seven constructions in three different environments, the frequency of the main clause construction in the non-initial environment was lower than in the initial environment. Right? If it was one, that would mean it was the same frequency as the sentence initial environment. But it was lower in every case and significantly lower in 18 cases. And you can see that in many of these cases it is much lower than the expected frequency. So, the low frequency of main clause phenomena in embedded clauses is predicted by syntactic and pragmatic theory because those are not main clauses. But these are main clauses. And so, other theories don't predict that um, main clause phenomena should be less common in those environments. So, how can we explain that? Well, if you think about these assumptions that I presented earlier about sentence processing, Sentence processing should be easier at the beginning of the sentence, right? Because there's less, there's no context that the, um, the words have to be integrated with. There's no previous context. And um, there's a less, fewer um, syntactic interpretations, therefore, that have to be considered. So it makes sense that a language would evolve to allow more syntactic possibilities at the beginning of a sentence. Whereas if you allowed these um, main clause phenomena later in the sentence, it might overwhelm the sentence processing mechanism. Now, one problem with this argument is that main clause phenomena actually do sometimes occur in non-initial environments, and we seem to be able to parse them. And my idea about this is that, well, maybe we do, can parse them, but maybe we use some special sort of second pass mechanism. Like we, we try to parse them and fail, and then we go back and take another, take another stab at it, or what's called a, a garden path effect in psycholinguistics. And actually, a number of the cases of non-initial main clause constructions do seem difficult to parse, to me at least. Like this one. To be sure, with a landfill comes the risk of running afoul of ever-tightening federal and state environmental regulation. So that's locative inversion in a pre-modified clause, pre clause. I don't know about you, but I find that sentence hard to process. Or, they said contributing to the downward drift was the fact that many professional traders had chosen to square positions ahead of the weekend. Parsable preposing in an embedded clause. I, I don't know. I find that sentence um, confusing. So the proposal is that we have a parsing heuristic along the lines of only consider main clause constructions in sentence initial context. And that heuristic works the vast majority of, of the time. And that makes parsing more efficient. So, to kind of tie this big digression into the main story, how does this relate to syntactic repetition? Well, we've seen that certain kinds of rare syntactic, syntactic expansions are used predominantly in cases where they are repeated. So maybe we also have a heuristic along the lines of only allow rare NP expansions in interpretations in which they are repeated. And this could facilitate <coughs> processing. We would still have to identify those expansions, but we, the idea is we wouldn't have to incorporate them into complete analyses of the sentence unless there was a repetition of the, of the expansion uh, nearby. And this could make parsing more efficient. So as a final example. Consider this famous sentence. The quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. Well, this sentence might not seem ambiguous, but in fact it is. The quick could be a noun phrase meaning quick people. Brown could be a verb meaning saute. Mm -hmm. Fox could be a mass noun, as in the sentence. And his favorite fruit is roasted fox from the ruffalo. Anyone who has small kids will know the book of the ruffalo. Jumped over the lazy dog could be a reduced relative passive, meaning perhaps attacked in a dispute about the lazy dog. So the sentence could mean, quick people saute fox meat that has been attacked in a dispute about the lazy dog. <laughs> now, it's not difficult to explain why we don't prefer this interpretation. It uses many low frequency constructions and low frequency lexemes like brown as a verb, and it's syntactically implausible in all kinds of ways. But surely we don't even consider this interpretation. Surely we don't even get to the point of evaluating this interpretation because we don't even construct it. And that's not so easy to explain because each of these uses 
can be comprehended, can be understood in certain contexts. So somehow we're able to understand these constructions and these usages um, when they're intended, but when they're not intended, we don't even consider them. And I think that's, how, how do we do that? Um, so, you know, the quick and the careless will do poorly on the exam. I think you can understand that sentence. So maybe in this Fox sentence, the quick is initially considered at a subliminal level, but because there isn't any other possible phrase with that construction in the vicinity, it's quickly discarded and it's not given further consideration. So I propose two heuristics, both relating to the use of rare syntactic construction. Use main clause phenomena only in sentence initial environments. Use rare noun phrase expansion only in cases where the expansion is repeated. And my idea is that if we apply these heuristics in comprehension, um, they could make parsing more efficient. And this might help us to explain what I think is the central mystery of sentence processing, which is that we're able to parse so accurately and so quickly. Thank you for your attention.